On this week's 51%, the Supreme Court has turned back a challenge of the Food and Drug Administration's approval and rules for mifepristone, preserving access to one of two pills commonly used in medication abortions. We speak with Harvard Law School's Carmel Shahar to learn what it all means. Nobody should read this as a big change in the Supreme Court's approach to cases that implicate abortion. I'm Jesse King. It's all up next on 51%. I was standing around like one of those girls I had seen in a movie. The whole world was a movie back then. I had my sunglasses on, I wanted to be seen without seeing Shiloh Alita. I wasn't really in it. I didn't really get it. You're listening to 51%, a WAMC production dedicated to women's issues and experiences. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Jesse King. The Supreme Court recently tossed out a Texas lawsuit challenging the Food and Drug Administration's approval and regulations for mifepristone. Mifepristone, which also goes by its brand name Mifeprex, is one of two pills commonly used in medication abortions, which are the most popular method of abortion in the U.S., especially since the court overturned Roe v. Wade with Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization in 2022. After Dobbs, this decision might seem like a 180 for the court. It did not side with the anti-abortion doctors who brought it up. But as our guest today will tell us, that's not necessarily true, and opponents of the pill are not barred from challenging it again in the future. Carmel Shahar is an assistant clinical professor of law at Harvard Law School and faculty director of the Health Law and Policy Clinic at the school's Center for Health Law and Policy Innovation. She says it's important to understand that this case was largely rejected on a technicality rather than for its arguments. So mifepristone is a pharmaceutical that has been approved since about 2000. At the time that it was initially approved by the FDA, there was a huge amount of evidence that went into the record that the FDA considered. FDA gave it approval, but put some restrictions upon its availability. In subsequent years, most notably in 2016 and in 2020, the FDA went back and looked at existing evidence and said, okay, we think that the body of evidence shows that this drug is quite safe and quite effective at what it does and can be made more available, that it doesn't necessarily need a physician to prescribe it. It could be a nurse practitioner, that it can be prescribed via telehealth in particular. And the plaintiffs in this case were pushing back against the FDA decision, saying, no, they came to the wrong conclusion based on the evidence, and the court should substitute their own judgment for the FDA's judgment. And obviously, the court decided not to do that. Um, But what was specifically its reasoning in rejecting this case? So when it comes to the Supreme Court's decision, I want to emphasize that The court here didn't really get to the central issue of the case, which Mm -hmm. is, did the FDA properly decide the availability of this pharmaceutical and should the courts instead decide what its appropriate availability looks like? Instead, they said, no, you know what, this is a case that never should have been. In part because in the law, we have this concept called standing, which means that you really need to have some sort of relationship to the issue in the case. You need to say, I am demonstrably hurt by something that happened, and I'm going to bring this lawsuit to rectify it, to remedy it. And so what the Supreme Court was saying is, we're not even going to answer the question that was put in front of us. We're just going to say, well, you know what? The people who brought this case didn't actually have enough of a relationship to the FDA's decision to bring this case. Uh, So that doesn't necessarily stop another challenge from coming down the line. Yeah, which the Supreme Court was quite explicit about. They said, you know, if you can find plaintiffs who have standing, great, bring this case. We will decide and figure out things then. But until then, the plaintiffs you do have, their relationship is so broad. It was some physicians who said, well... At some point, we might have to treat a patient who might have an incredibly rare side effect from using this medication for a medication abortion. And they said that's so broad. If we if we said this was enough to constitute standing, then basically anybody could 
sue on anything, even if they really had nothing to do with the issue. Mm, Okay. And so then for this specific case, does it go back to Texas or does it die here? So that is a little bit of an open question. The court focused mostly on whether the physician plaintiffs had standing. There are some states who joined the case. And so it's possible that they might have standing, but that's going to need to be worked out. You mentioned that if they had ruled in favor of the plaintiffs in this case, then you could say that almost anybody could sue over anything in a way. Um, Specifically, I guess then, how would this have impacted the FDA approval process and the broader pharmaceutical industry? Yeah, so I think that the Supreme Court found it attractive to punt on standing, in part because of the broader implications that this case could have on the pharmaceutical industry, as well as on our legal system in general. So I'm going to first talk about the pharmaceutical industry. Mm -hmm. Right now, having FDA approval really means something when it comes to your business model as a pharmaceutical company. Like when you have FDA approval, it means great. You have a drug that you can sell in the United States, across the United States. The agency in charge of gatekeeping the pharmaceutical marketplace has said, okay, you can come on in. This case, if it had been decided in favor of the plaintiffs, would have really undermined that. Because the truth is that Mifepristone had a really, really well-developed body of evidence and that the consensus that side effects are very uncommon, meaning the drug is like pretty safe and that it is effective at what it does, was pretty rigorous. So it would be hard for a pharmaceutical company to develop a better body of evidence for approval than what we had for Mifepristone which means that basically any pharmaceutical might be vulnerable to a challenge by physicians saying, hey, we think the FDA got it wrong. That's unworkable because it takes a lot of money to bring a pharmaceutical to market. And if you don't have the certainty that once FDA approves it, you can sell it, it makes it very, very difficult for the pharmaceutical companies to bring anything to market, really. The second issue is what this case would have meant for the legal doctrine. So Justice Kavanaugh, who wrote the opinion for the court, correctly noted that if they had accepted standing in this case, it could have allowed a really wide range of lawsuits to challenge basically any public health policy. Like you might have physicians saying, okay, well, I have to work on gunshot wounds. So I should be able to challenge policies around gun control or that people who are kind of bystanders to public policy. I believe that Kavanaugh gave the example of lawsuits by teachers in states near the Mexico border could challenge immigration policies because they might lead to overcrowded classrooms. Hmm. And so Kavanaugh said, you know what, our legal system is set up that not every citizen can honestly challenge every government decision. There are certain government decisions where, you know, you might not like it. You might be like, oh, it sucks that my government is putting forward this policy that I think is bad. But that's not actually enough of a nexus for you to go to court and tell the courts you should do something about this. So let's just reiterate what this means for access to mifepristone. Basically, that access isn't changing right now, but what does that look like? Yeah, so right now there is access to mifepristone, which is good because it is a very helpful component of telemedicine abortions. The data I've seen, it's something like 8,000 to 9,000 women a month use it. Mifepristone also has some uses elsewhere. I want to say it's not that there's no legal risk to the availability of mifepristone at all, because as I mentioned, there were three states that had joined this case. And so it may be possible that they will revisit this legal claim on behalf of the states. But it certainly makes it a lot more secure, because had the court found in favor of the plaintiffs, it would have 
either eliminated access to mifepristone entirely, or if it had agreed with the Fifth Circuit, would have really kind of dialed back to pre-2016, pre-2020, meaning that you wouldn't be able to get mifepristone prescribed via telehealth. Certainly, access to abortion is still very much under attack in our country. And there is another case that the Supreme Court is about to announce their decision on whether EMTALA, which is the federal law saying that if you show up in an emergency room, the hospital has to give you life-saving treatment to stabilize you, whether that allows for a patient who needs a life-saving abortion to get one when that person shows up in an emergency room and needs to be stabilized. And I think this case was really interesting in that Justice Kavanaugh explicitly talked about the fact that the federal government has sort of these morality clauses, these conscientious objection clauses, saying that physicians can't be forced to provide care against their will. And that felt like a little bit of a foreshadowing of where the court might go in terms of the Mtala case. I think there are other clouds on the horizon for sure. For example, states that have criminalized abortion are trying to think of ways to reach physicians in other states who are providing telemedicine abortions and shut that off. And I think especially if there's a change in administration, we might see use of the Comstock law to prevent medical abortion pills from being mailed across state lines. And you might see that kind of more broadly trying to shut down access to telemedicine abortions. I appreciate you bringing up the Amtala case. I think I should probably point out that at the time of this taping anyway, the Supreme Court hasn't released its ruling on emergency room abortions yet. Um, I'm glad you brought up the Comstock Act too. That's a very old, like pretty much like zombie law that we've talked about a couple times on this show. But for those who don't know, could you elaborate for me a little bit more about what the Comstock Act is? So the Comstock law is a very old law, actually, like think late 19th century, where essentially it said you can't mail obscenities through the mail. In part, you know, that's defined as like pornography, but there is explicit language in the Comstock Act saying that you're not allowed to use the U.S. Postal Service for items that have abortion causing purposes. This law, there are a lot of laws that are old, that are kind of still on the books that people eventually just kind of ignore. So like a lot of towns might have laws about whether you can graze your horse in the park. That law is still technically a good law, but like nobody really cares about it because like we don't have horses anymore. So it's irrelevant. The Comstock law had been more ignored than particularly paid attention to in the last little while, especially as like social ideas around, say, like pornography and birth control have shifted. But now there's increasing concern that especially a Republican administration would use the Comstock law to prevent mailing surgical tools, medications, that would help with abortions. Well, Carmel, thank you so much for taking the time. Um, Is there anything that we haven't touched on that you want to make sure people know? One point that I want to make is that I don't think that we should necessarily see this as a big judicial win. This isn't the court saying, oh, you know what, looking at back at Dobbs, we kind of got it wrong. We wish that we had better facilitated access to abortion. I think this is very much still the same court that felt comfortable with Dobbs. I just think that this case in particular had such broad issues for the stability of the pharmaceutical industry and had such poor standing that it made it an easy out for the Supreme Court to say, like, we just, that's going too far. We're not willing to blow up the idea of standing. We're not willing to blow up the value of FDA approval to limit access to this particular abortion medication. But I do think that if the anti-abortion side can find plaintiffs that do have standing, that you might see a different income. 
outcome. And I would not be surprised to see kind of a follow on case in the next couple of years as they try to figure out the right plaintiffs. Like nobody should read this as a big change in the Supreme Court's approach to cases that implicate abortion. Carmel Shahar is an assistant clinical professor of law and faculty director of the Health Law and Policy Clinic at Harvard Law School's Center for Health Law and Policy Innovation. You can learn more about her work at chlpi.org. Finally, here in New York's capital region, Upper Hudson Planned Parenthood recently celebrated its 90th anniversary. Since its founding in 1934, UHPP has witnessed the fight to legalize both birth control and abortion. Its ability to provide care in general was limited by religious influence and directives in Albany long after Roe v. Wade. It didn't start providing abortion until 1985. Now all three of its centers provide abortion care, but Planned Parenthood does a lot more than abortions. UHPP also offers gender-affirming care, STD testing, prenatal and postpartum care, mental health services, and more. Ahead of a gala celebrating the anniversary, WAMC Sarah LaDuke recently spoke with former UHPP president and CEO Patricia McGeown, as well as current president and CEO Shelley Hegan. Before we discuss current and future challenges, I would like to spend a little time in a positive arena, if we can, and talk about <laughs> some of your your victories with UHPP. Wow. Well, that is often not what people want to hear. So thank you. Sure. Um, because, um, you know, a lot of times when I talk about Upper Hudson Planned Parenthood, I think I'm always like, the world outside is absolutely crazy, but here in our community, things are actually very good. Over the last few years, we have added new services, so we've um, expanded our gender-affirming care for trans patients, and that service started maybe five years ago, and we're seeing over 2,500 people every year here in our three health centers. We expanded our abortion access to go to 17 weeks, which um, really captures most people's needs, and we've seen that service very well accepted. We've also grown our behavioral health care. Previously, we just saw such an, a need for young people and um, our patient population to have access to mental health services, which were just sorely difficult for people to get, especially people without insurance or Medicaid. No, of course. And that service doubles almost every year. And we're up to around 5,000 patients each year, nearly of half of whom identify as gender expansive. And so we know that that's also a population that wasn't getting care um, in a safe and respectful place. So that's been super exciting to do. And then we're getting ready to launch a big marketing campaign on menopause care. So nobody thinks about Planned Parenthood when they think about menopause. But I have just seen so much in the New York Times and in the Washington Post and places where privileged people are getting information. But for women who rely on Medicaid as their primary insurance and for black women in particular, menopause hits hard and no one's talking about it and nobody's making sure that they have access to really great care that's relatively easy and our providers already know how to do it. So it's really a, a question of marketing it and making sure that people know that we're there for them their whole lives. I gave you what you may have perceived as sort of a bizarre grin when you said menopause, but it's been suddenly coming up all the time. It's like the last frontier of things we need to talk about as women so that people understand mm -hmm. another part of our life. I am saying to my husband all the time, like, I'm tired. Do you think it's perimenopause? <laughs> yes. <laughs> He's like, yeah. I mean, I don't know. He's like, you're the one learning all about it to tell me and I'll learn about it too. But yeah. we got to figure it out together. Um, now let's get into the the heavy stuff. We are facing a nation that no longer federally protects a woman's right to abortion or a birthing person's right to abortion. What are you going to do? Why don't you take that, Pat? I'll start way back because Please things do. have changed. and Some of it is progress. Some of it isn't. When I first took the job, my announcement was made in late 1994. December 30th, 1994, two young women 
working in abortion providing clinics in Brookline, Massachusetts, were killed. I was riding in a car with my nine year old son. It was the holiday school vacation. And I immediately got angry. Less than two years earlier, Dr. David Gunn in Pensacola, Florida had been murdered, and I'm just mad about this. And this little voice goes, Mom, that's what you're going to do. And I got home that day, and this was a day, this was a time of uh, answering machines. We didn't have cell phones. Right. And my answering machine was jammed with reporters, everyone wanting a comment, whatever. But the very first message was from my mother. And she said, what are you thinking? You're a mother. You can't take this job. I will say, parenthetically, I happened to see my son, now a grown man, with a family of his own, and I recounted that to him this morning. And he said, well, I hope you said to her, it's because I'm a mother that I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. So that's my son. Great. Congratulations. But, <laughs> <laughs> I came into the job in early 1995, and my first responsibility was to hire armed guards for all of our centers. Now, I'm a public health person. I have an advanced degree in public health. I worked in the healthcare field for my entire career, and it's like, what am I doing here? You know, I don't know from armed guards, but that was the first thing I had to do. And the second was to start a capital campaign to raise funds to install bullet resistant glass at all of the centers. So that's the beginning of my life with it's Planned Parenthood. so frightening, and really we would, intimidating. We would come in in the morning sometimes, and lo the locks were jammed with glue. This was the olden days of locks. So we were at the top of the list of the locksmith. Our gates to our parking lot would sometimes be padlocked, and sometimes with someone attached to the padlock. Oftentimes, staff would be coming in early in the morning, and people would be out on the sidewalk yelling taunts at them. And it was particularly upsetting when they knew the names of some of our providers. It was a, a tough, different atmosphere than what is there now. Um, no less tough, but for a variety of other reasons. There's a lot that we have done. And, you know, as I said before, our centers now are highly uh, protected. In fact, I, I recall even before I left, we had a, a staff person who was unfortunately in a domestic violence situation. And when she met with the police, they said, well, where do you work? And she said, Planned Parenthood. And they said, you're safe there. We forged excellent relationships with uh, local law enforcement. I assume we still have them. I think the FBI is still in my speed dial. Oh, <laughs> Fortunately, gosh. I've had no occasion to use it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we really moved forward in that regard, but now there's a whole other set of issues that need to be addressed. There's always been the political issue. I can remember crying, watching hearings where people were calling for the defunding of Planned Parenthood and just putting lie after lie out there. And I was thinking of my staff who worked so hard, who had to come home, p perhaps to families who were seeing this and maybe even believing it, when what they were doing was so good and so heroic. Um, today, we're dealing with cybersecurity issues and, and different types of problems, along with what people didn't think would ever come, which was the loss of Roe v. Wade. I will also say that even when I was still there 12 years ago, we were talking about that happening mm -hmm. and being greeted with, you know, shrugs and we're chicken little, the sky is falling in. And we kept saying, the case is there. They're waiting for the court to be there. And unfortunately, they found it. I, I'm sure Shelley can speak to the more current threats that we're dealing with and how we're responding there. Yeah, it is very different, even from when I started. So I started um, at Upper Hudson 18 years ago, and I worked for Pat, and um, it was different then. It was definitely uh, people lining up outside of the building, that sort of thing. One of the things um, that she spoke about, which was is a huge part of her legacy at Upper Hudson, was moving that Albany Health Center off of Lark Street and into a place where we have a lot more privacy and security. Um, taking a page out of that book, we moved both our Troy and Hudson Health Centers to be similarly situated. Mm -hmm. So they're in parking lot spaces with private property surrounding them. So we don't really have um, that in-your-face, right-outside-the-door protester situation that we used to have. I also 
will always love our community because we don't the community is not as supportive of um, folks protesting our health centers in those ways that other communities have to struggle with in a really real way. Um, I've been even in Syracuse, Rochester, Buffalo, where the protesting is really quite aggressive. Um, our, our community wouldn't really put up with that. So there, that's a nice thing to know. But where we are now is um, they're using the courts all over the country. So it really isn't just uh, the Supreme Court and what happened with Dobbs, but there are the Judge Kaczmierics in Texas who will take, you know, who folks are ju- judge shopping out. Um, they're t- really trying to cripple us and slow us down both financially and in the um, public opinion with these outrageous court cases. So we are kind of constantly on alert in a way that we didn't have to be before of what's happening in Texas or what's happening in Oklahoma or a case coming out of Idaho. Those things matter now in ways that they kind of didn't used to um, because of Dobbs. Right, of course, yeah. (laughs) You know, when we knew we had some basic protections. And also I think we used to have courts across the country while there would be a bad one here or there. Um, we had courts across the country that we could rely upon. And um, I think that's some of the biggest hazards when I think about looking forward is not only that the courts are not supportive of the facts and the law, but that um, we are living in a culture now that is slowly losing confidence and faith in the court. And so without that in both directions, this is this is why throughout history, attack Women and women's rights and reproductive freedom in the service of autocracy, that's where we are. Is we've, we've gotten to a place now where nothing is really stable because everything's become somewhat unstable. That was WAMC's Sarah LaDuke speaking with Shelley Hegan and Patricia McKeown, the current and former presidents and CEOs of Upper Hudson Planned Parenthood, which recently celebrated its 90th anniversary. You can learn more at PlannedParenthood.org. You've been listening to 51%. 51% is a national production of WAMC Northeast Public Radio in Albany, New York. It's produced and hosted by me, Jesse King. Our associate producer is Jody Cowan, and our theme is Lolita by the Albany-based artist Girl Blue. Just a reminder that you can listen to 51% anytime at wamcpodcast.org or wherever you get your podcasts. You can stay in the loop on all of WAMC shows by signing up for our weekly newsletter, Airwaves, at wamc.org. We hope you'll join us next week. Until then, I'm Jesse King, 51%. I was every single girl, I was nobody else, I was so sure of myself. I was 15 and a half, he was a hollow laugh. And I lost my cool somewhere along the way, the night bed on the hall. Take it.